Hi. Well, it's 3 o'clock Eastern Time. Uh, it's noon over on the West Coast. And let's get started. Uh, my name is Mitch Weisberg. I'm here for EdChat Interactive. Um, and I'll be, for the most part, behind the scenes, although I'd like to give a brief introduction to what you're going to be doing today. Uh, we're going to be uh, led by uh, Russ Qualia, and he's going to be talking to Susan Kulianos and uh, Lisa Land in a few minutes. Um, first, a little bit about EdChat Interactive. Uh, we just we started EdChat Interactive as a way to uh, liven up webinars to make them a lot more interactive and more in line with the way people learn. And hopefully, you'll see that as we progress today. Um, just a few things that I want to uh, bring uh, get you aware of is that underneath your icon there are two buttons. Uh, one button is a picture of a hand. Uh, if you click on the on the hand button, it raises your hand and it says to me that that you want you, you want my attention and um, and we can chat or you can ask me a question or or, or whatever. Um, but we can also use that for a little bit. Um, you know, as, as, as kind of a polling device. So let's just practice a little bit. Um, I'm curious, how many of you are, uh, are participating from within the United States? If you're within the United States, click on the raise hand button. And, um, and I'll see that. And it looks like, um, it looks like about two thirds of the people here are from the United States and about a third are from then by uh, by definition uh, outside of the United States so I'd like to welcome all of you who are not in, in the US if you um, if you can reclick the uh, raise hand button it'll it'll lower your hand and then the other button there is ask um, if you click on the ask button you gonna be asking a question I'll be able to see that and I'll be able to then funnel that question uh, to Russ and and the other guests so that's probably the best way to ask a general question is to uh, click on the ask button, type in something, and um, and then I'll pass it on to Russ. Um, but the, you could also, uh, if you move your cursor over your avatar, you see that there's five buttons that show up, one of which is IM. And if you click on the IM button, that's another good way to interact with people who are attending today. Uh, you can type in a comment, you can type in a question. If you're in the same room as Russ, we have and it turns out we have two rooms here today so far. Uh, but if you're in the same room as Russ, uh, he'll, see the, he'll see your comment. If you're in a different room, then the other people in the room will, will see the comment. Um, and it could be at different times, Russ will ask you, how many of you people, how many of you have an experience like so-and-so uh, related? And then you could type something into the IM. Um, and then uh, the, the um, biggest reason why we're using Shindig is because it gives you the ability to interact with each other and us the ability to interact with you also. So let me uh, shrink this and you should be able to see the icons of other people who are attending here. And if, if somebody has an icon that has video, you can click on that video and you can enter into conversation with that person. Um, I, I'm not sure if, if this is in Russ's plans, but a number of moderators on EdChat Interactive will ask questions and encourage people to work in small groups. So um, normally we would go through an exercise where you practice that, but I think today, because uh, you know, because Russ generally has so much information that's really interesting, I'm going to skip that um, and just you know quickly let you know we have uh, three more events coming up in the next week. This evening uh, we have Steve Piha, who's going to be uh, continuing his series on high leverage strat strategies for teaching writing. He's going to be talking about revision tonight. On Monday, we're going to have Young Zhao, um, who has uh, studied world um, education around the world for, for about 20 years. And he's going to be talking, leading a discussion on world-class learning. And then um, on March 17th is, is a, a, new, uh, a new type of event with Alex uh, Bell and S Sylvan Baker. And they're going to be talking about something called immersive democracy which is based on the arts and it's a way of getting people, uh, kids and teachers and administrators and parents involved in uh, school democracy and it kind of fits right in with, with school voice. So, um, so let me just uh, stop this and let me get Russ up here. 
And there you are. Hi. Uh, hey, man. Um, um, welcome, everybody. It's it's hard for me to believe that these months go by as quick as they do, and, and here we are again. I'm happy to say this is actually the first time I'm doing this from where we originally thought we were going to do them all, which is in Portland, Maine. So it's, it's actually nice to be here. We have a super packed hour um, from Susan Kulianos, who is in Ohio, who will be joining us. Um, the woman that Mitch did not mention, Ingrid uh, from the Netherlands. I think he didn't mention Ingrid because we can't say her last name. Um, but I'm going to give it a try when I do introduce Ingrid to come on, on board in just a bit. And then uh, Lisa Landy, who is, some of you have seen her on here before, in charge of the Teacher Voice and Aspirations uh, International Center. And then I want to hand it back over to Mick, the last 15 minutes or so, to kind of deal with some questions, answers. He'll give some updates along with some of the team members that, that are online. So I'm going to jump right in. Um, again, Mitch, thank you so much for doing this. I just, I am a huge Shindig fan, and he knows I do, I do not say that lightly because um, I actually just, not a major fan of any of these kinds of things, but I actually am a fan of the Shindig, and, and Mitch's support is just, it's seamless, it's it's good, and just, I couldn't be happier or proud to be a part of that. So thank you, Mitch, for all you're doing for us. Let me start off, as I usually do, some quick updates. Just returned um, from a board meeting. Um, in the UK, the Aspirations Academy Trust had their one of their three board meetings, and we had that. Uh, we also had a leadership seminar in the UK. Mickey was there uh, with me and talked about Project Aspire, actually. And the other person that was with us this time was Ray McCulty, the dean of Southern New Hampshire University, and um, studying and talked a lot about it, the leadership seminar about connecting leadership, innovation, and school voice. So that's, that's all moving well right now. We've got 12 schools kind of edging our way forward to 14 schools um, by next September. And that's both exciting and incredibly scary. The work we're doing in LSAU, LAUSD continues to move forward. Um, it's an interesting place for me where they have over 600,000 students, uh, over 50,000 teachers, 100,000 employees overall. It's, it's crazy to me. And, it's interesting for that place being somewhat perceived as impersonal. I've never seen a more personalized um, kind of connectedness of people within each of these districts. We work specifically now in East District, and um, the more I work there and the more things we do there, the more impressed I am. Mickey, Wade, and I were there recently, did a, a student piece, um, which is really fun to do with the parents. And what, what I love about working in LAUSD, when I talk to the staff and I ask, you know, who's from this area? 90% of the people that raise their hand are, are former students there or grew up there and so on. So it's not, um, you don't have to do any convincing how important the work is there. They get it and uh, I become more and more impressed. Cobb County, Cobb County in Georgia has officially come on board um, doing work with their teacher academy. Lisa's leading that work while also kicking off their leadership summit. So it's actually one of the very few, few and first places, I guess one of the first places we're working with really systemic change across the district from teachers to the leadership team. And I'm proud to announce that Daniel Middle School, the middle school, one of the middle schools in Cobb County will officially become a demonstration site in September. Met with the principal there and some key staff. And it, he's, <laughs> I don't know how to explain other than a ball of fire and excitement and uh, passion about what he does. Some updates on the book front. Um, I am happy to say the principal, principal Voice book called Principal Voice, Listen, Learn, and Lead is in press. That will be out in June. The Teacher Voice book called Teacher Voice, Amplifying Success is in press now as well. That will be out in July. Um, and last but not least, Aspire Higher is, uh, we just got the book reviews back last week. Um, crazy great reviews. Um, four out of five of them were incredibly positive. The one out of the five was not, so we're just going to ignore that person. The um, <laughs> obviously someone that doesn't give a crap about kids. The um, but the Aspire High book, uh, really led by by Dr. Mickey Corso and, and Dr. Chris Fox, um, just it's a it's a cool piece, quite frankly, and it takes the best of what we've been talking about for the past, I guess, over 30 years now, and. Uh, 
I'm looking forward to that coming out. That'll be out in January. We've got a, a little more work to do on it. And last but not least, I throw this out there, and I'll remind you of this again the next time we get together. It's a parent voice book. Um, we're getting a little pressure to do a parent voice book. I, quite frankly, really don't want to do one. Uh, I'm not convinced I should do one. So uh, I ask in, in, in all earnest if, if you can think of good reasons why we should do a parent voice book. I would love to hear from you whether on Twitter or email me directly. It is something serious that needs to be addressed. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how to go at it yet. I can't see Mickey right now, but I'm pretty sure he's smiling because Mickey's been telling me we need to do this for the past 20 years. Um, finally, um, I want to shift gears pretty much in a hurry today because um, I want to get on our, our story on our aspirations and what's going on in the field. And let me first bring up, if we can, Mitch, Susan, Susan Kulianas. I'm with my team. Awesome. Hi, team. Hi. Well, I got to tell you, you've got the best looking team we've ever had before, so I think that's pretty impressive. Hi. Um, so, Susan, the team is, is from Youngstown. We've been doing some work there. Uh, Susan Inman has actually been leading that work. They tell me Susan has been the principal there for four years, a principal for eight, in education for over 23. All incredibly impressive. Um, but Susan, it's, it's interesting, when my team comes back from Youngstown, they'll tell me some updates. And every time they mention your name and talk about your staff and what's going on in the school, it's like this big giant smile on their face. So um, just like the smiles I'm seeing right now, actually. So what I'd like to do is for you and your team, share what you're doing and, and what kind of growth pattern you've seen from where you started with this work from Susan, Susan Inman. Um, to where you are right now, where do you see it going? I just, and again, but before I do, thank you for making this work. It really is special to see you on your team. Oh, well, thank you so much for having us. And we enjoy doing Qualia. We don't feel like it's another program. It's a way of life that we implement the different conditions. And we um, are a big advocates of student voice and adult voice and that's why I brought some team members because it's not about me it's about the building in general and all the great things that we're doing um, we've made some tremendous gains and we've had some really great success and it's finally showing in their state achievements and so we're really proud of what we're doing here at Harding a um, couple things that we might want to talk about is some things with adult voice. One thing that we feel has been a huge impact. Um, when I first came on my first year, I basically did the interviewing for new teachers coming into Youngstown um, for the building. And then the second year, I decided, let's have a team. Let's create a team of teachers and staff interview um, prospective interviewees to come in and um, want to have a position here at Youngstown at Harding and we feel that that has been probably the number one thing that has made a big turnaround in this building and I want my two colleagues to talk about the process because they've both been on the team for the last couple years and we've noticed that the people that we hired as a team those teachers have stayed with us because they feel part of a family, they feel part of a dedication, they want to have the same aspirations and professional community that we so appreciate. And I think it's made our Harding team so strong and we're really, really proud of that. But I'm going to let Tiff and um, Leah also talk about that because it's just been a huge part of Harding. Great. Thank you. I just Hi, how are you? I'm great. Oh, I never met you. You're like a superstar to me. <laughs> this is our number one Project Aspire girl this right is, here. Yeah. Yeah. If I'm her superstar, she's number one in my book already. So. <laughs> sorry. sorry. Um, no, I just think that the whole staff voice and embracing the interview process and us having a say in it and owning it and wanting to be part of the hiring process, I think just helps us buy into and invest in the people that we are bringing into our family. You know, they see us as a unit, as a strong team, and I think that that's important, and that's what having staff voice is all about, because like Susan said, she's not by herself. You know, we're here with her every step of the way, and I think that um, a lot of times principals can feel alone in that, you know, role. 
of leading the building. And I think our movement is because we have embraced qualia and we have been able to use it as um, a plateau, you know, to have a voice and to make things that are important, just like hiring new staff members. Can you, either one of you, can you talk for a second about how do you, because I know a lot of the stuff that goes on in Youngstown, or, or certainly did, how do you take this so it's not perceived as another program, but rather a framework to implement something? Because some of the pushback we get from not our demonstration sites, but the schools, oh man, not something else. But how do you look at this? How do you present this to the staff? Um, and how does the staff adopt something so it's not perceived as, man, this is something else I need to do. But probably here's the way of thinking, like you said. I think the big thing, um, Dr. Quay, is to see that it's all connected with what we're doing. It's connected with our BLT process. It's connected with our OTES evaluation process and principal evaluation process. It's connected to our hiring process. It's connected to our frameworks with Literacy Collaborative and Bridges the framework. Everything that we do is connected together. So we don't feel like Qualia is another thing that's put on our plates. It's actually embedded right in everything that we're doing, and it fits beautifully. Um, so we feel like we're going to take this, and we're just going to keep going with it, and we're adding um, other um, parameters to it to make it even stronger with the student voice and the adult voice. But we have grown tremendously in the last four years, and, and predominantly the last two years. I think I've, I've given up on the fact that I can't control everything and I don't want to control everything and I need help. And I look upon my teaching staff to help me make those really um, decisions. And therefore, they feel like they have ownership every single day in this community. It's not me on my own. And that, that has been fantastic because as everyone knows, Youngstown, it, it's, it can be a difficult place at times. We are under um, watch with ODE, but I feel, you know, we are doing such a great job here, and we're putting ourselves on the map, and it's showing in our results. And our kids are happy. They want to be here. Our staff is happy. They want to be here every day. Avion um, Cataldo, please come to the front office. This is what happens. Avion Cataldo, <laughs> to the front office, please. He's going to make a comment about that. <laughs> the children are looking at a real school, so at least. <laughs> the show must go on, right? The show is going on. So I just think you know, finding connections is huge because then your staff knows, oh my gosh, you're not putting another thing on us. And that's, yep. that's been um, a big impact. Here's uh, Leah. She would like to share some things. Hello. Um, just going off of what Susan said about making connections and implementing this and things that we already do, um, this year I started doing with my class, um, you know, with ODE coming in and they want to see us posting their targets. I mean, we've been doing that for for years, our learning targets, um, you know, because Susan's always ahead of the game with that that kind of stuff. So we have been, you know, really good with that. But I also wanted to put it on the students, you know, for them to be able to watch themselves, um, you know, whether they can reach those targets individually, and you know, when they can, the sense of accomplishment that they have, um, I think, ties in with Qualia. So I think that's just a perfect example of how Susan's not expecting us to do something completely different or new, we're just embedding it into things that we already do, which I think is that that's why it's been, you know, so successful in our school. And I just have to say about Susan overall, as a principal, she involves us in everything. I mean, I'm talking like she's called us up here before and been like, what should I spend this money on? And we're like, well, let's see, you know, so I mean, she always gives us a voice. So um, yeah, she does a great job with that. I just had to add that. Well, thank you. I mean, they make my job easy. I've got I've got a great team, and and that's why I'm here. Um, all of us could go probably somewhere else to work, but we are invested here at Harding, so we're excited about the changes that we're making. Competition board today. Hopefully, we'll get some more tomorrow. We are ready for inspiring minds. Inspiring minds, you are dismissed. How good is that? What you get? Part of dismissal. 
Yeah. <laughs> I think it's great. You know what's funny? I don't know if you can see this, but I can look around and see my staff even around this table, and they've got these huge smiles on their face just just hearing from the three of you. So you do my hot product, and quite frankly, you're my superstars out there. Um, there's not a meeting we have, I am telling you, Susan, that you and your team um, are not mentioned, and I mean in great light. Yeah. So I appreciate thank what you, you so do. much. No, thank you. Thank you so much for seeing all the great things that we're doing. And I just want to say, at first, it started out with the sense of accomplishment, with behavior, with our kids doing well with our behavior and, and making changes. But now we're seeing our sense of accomplishment in our academics. And our kids are able to talk the talk. We have kindergartners sharing how they're going to improve a reading level and, and what they're going to do to improve. Little kindergartners articulating it with using that power of vocabulary um, language that they have. It's amazing. They've made um, suggestions um, with our computer um, lab and how we can utilize that better. We always listen to our students to see how can we make this a better environment, not just behaviorally, but educationally. And students have better ideas than mm -hmm. us. Yeah, and that's what's been so amazing, because our kids are fighting to be on that student qualia team. And they want to have a voice. And we've even projected it where you don't always have to be on the qualia team, but give that Give the Qualia team students ideas so we can share. And so it's just been a huge move that um, we have been doing here at Harding that we're really, really proud of. Yeah. That is incredible. Susan, thank, thank all of you. I mean, it, it's, I don't even know what to say other than I would love you to stay on there, the three, but I want to bring up Ingrid, but before I do, I just, I really do want to thank you again and, and talk to you. We've got some cool stuff coming up, and my head is already spinning around NAESP, the National Association of Elementary School Principals, so we could do something together between your team and my team doing a joint piece. I, mean, I think there's all sorts of potential out there, and this means a lot to me, so, and this will be happening in September, connecting you guys up with our schools in Dubai uh, and in Sweden and in England, because... You're doing some great stuff and you need to share that with other places and so thank you and i want to thank you and i just want to i want to brag about my team for one one thing that we're so proud of i've got to tell you this um just recently we got information about our value added score and our value added score has to do with students it has to do with the improvement that our students do and in one year's time they they grade you in a one year's time what are we doing with our students we received an A on our report card because not only are we taking students one year, Please but we're showing sure growth by two coach. years, two or we more years for, both. Uh, so it's amazing what we're doing, and we finally got that A on our riders. report card, Again, and we're so excited because we've been coach saying coach. all along that Community we're making a difference with our kids. So I just need to share that about my team. I'm really proud of what we're doing here. And um, it can be done in an urban setting. It can be done in a rural setting. You just need to have those high expectations of those kids, and they will they will take the lead with you. Beautiful. Well, listen, again, thank you so much. Stay on right there because I want you to hear from Ingrid and what else is going on here. I'm sure there will be some questions out there. The other thing I want to share with you and everybody else is that what we've learned from doing these things, because they're getting beamed all over the world, we have to have X amount of people here, and then it just grows exponentially over the next few weeks. And we've got schools in New Zealand, in Dubai, and in Sweden. I'm just trying to think of all the places, India, um, Brazil. So um, you're going to be a little bit of everywhere um, at Harding, which is which is pretty awesome, actually. So so thank you again, Tiff, Lee, and Susan. Dr. Thank you Paulia, so much. Can I, just, can I just tell you, though, what a big fan I am of your work? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like starstruck, but I think, I think importantly, though, and from speaking from the teachers here at Harding, we just truly appreciate the framework that you set, the foundation. And like Susan said, we've made those that our students have, and they own it. And it's because of your program. And I mean, the ownership is just amazing. It's something That's to awesome. see. It's remarkable. Thank you. I'm, I'm all red right now. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, stay right there. Um, can we bring Ingrid up, please? 
Hello. Hi, you? Hello, can everybody hear me? Yeah, this is great. So let, let, let me introduce um, Ingrid first. So Ingrid is from the Netherlands, and, and this was interesting. Um, Ingrid, could you just say, I can give you a second last name, Palman. Well, how do you say the, your third? Uh, Dijkenha. Ah, that's good. Dijkenha. Some Yes. So uh, let's stick with Ingrid. Yes. <laughs> Um, so here's the interesting thing. So the past couple of weeks I've been seeing these webinar stuff go up and people are talking about global things and the international perspective and I'm saying, you know, I've got Ohio on there and I'm going to have Lisa Lee here from Idaho and as cosmopolitan as Youngstown is in, in, in Boise, Idaho, I said, wow, we, we better get somebody from abroad and I just heard from Ingrid last week who her and two of her colleagues are translating the student voice book into Dutch. And this is 9 p.m. or 9.30 in, in the Netherlands right now, and I asked Ingrid to come on and, and share some, some work that she's doing there, and she just, without missing a beat, said yes. So Ingrid, thank you. The piece I'm most intrigued about is this right here. She's the head teacher of the initial teacher training program um, at the Applied Sciences in Wundersham in the Netherlands. But here's the piece that I love. She's working with her students and runs a research group around the question, how can we use student voice as an instrument for change? Um, so Ingrid, if you could kind of just give all of us in a few minutes a perspective of the interest in the Netherlands, your interest in this, and some initial findings um, from your students would be really great. But really a hot well, thank you for coming on board. You're welcome. I'm I'm very I'm almost almost much as excited as the other teachers are because I've been following your work for a couple of years now, and um, uh, I kind of took my colleagues uh, with it. And the first thing that we um, that we did was just getting the attention um, of our our team to think about student voice, and uh, so we kind of started talking about it within our initial teacher trainer program. But also, uh, because I'm also part of a master program, and uh, we do a lot of innovative stuff over there. So we, um, we thought, so how can we use, uh, and use is never, it sounds kind of funny, like you want to use, because it's a, co it's a collaboration that you want to do with students, but also within the schools that we work with. Mm -hmm. And so um, it goes as follows. We have students in our master program who all work within education, within the, within the educational field. So uh, they need to uh, come up with an innovation that they need to use within their own practice. So, um, so I kind of am interested from my own PhD program in leadership for learning. And uh, my, in my opinion, uh, leadership for learning only started when you have a voice. Then only you, you can be a leader. So I kind of, you know, uh, started researching upon that idea. And, um, you know, I shared it with my students, of course. And then a couple of students said, Ingrid, this is such inter so, uh, so interesting. Couldn't we start a research group? And um, that's kind of how it started. <laughs> and um, I have uh, about 12 students working within 12 different uh, areas within the educational field, from primary school to university and everything in the middle, so high school, uh, secondary school. The system is a little bit different than it is in, the, in America. Um, so. We're trying to work with the framework and also with um, uh, part of the leadership challenge by Kausas and Posner when we are combining the, the framework with the leadership challenge to see how can we enable ownership, uh, how can we support students within the schools to uh, be leader of their own learning and use belonging, use self-worth, uh, use the aspiration framework and use those ideas. But the, the interesting finding at the moment is that now we're having a, I couldn't, I, I want to say a hard time, but it's, it's, you know, it's also, it's something that we challenge ourselves to, is to see, do we see where voice actually uh, is made clear? So do we notice as teachers where we can actually support children and students to say, oh, you can step up here and this is, this is where you can have a voice? Because what we notice in the Netherlands, and I don't know for America, I've been for a couple of months, so I'm not really familiar, very familiar, um, is that uh, teachers have um, 
relevance. So when we come up with the aspiration work and say, you know, uh, are you looking at self-worth? Are you looking at engagement? So how far does the engagement go? Yeah, as as um, when you look at the participation model, let's say by fielding, yeah, also it's also being used in your book. Uh, then we see that it's very low. It's a very low standard. Um, not to judge, yeah. It's not to, to be judgmental, but it's something that we notice now is that uh, participation is almost at the the area of I'm the teacher and you may participate by the by the assignment that I give you. And uh, we are actually now in the process process at our university and uh, and also an in initial teacher trainer program that we say, but that is not engagement. So what what is real engagement? And this is a big discussion. And of course we're of course I'm working at the university, but also with all these skills, uh, schools in the area. Um, mm -hmm. I think lots of fun stuff is going on, but it's not easy. <laughs> but it's a great, it's a great challenge. Good for you. Well, I, Ingrid, I'm so impressed with what you're doing and how you and your colleagues have taken on that book. I think that's that's great. Um, but more importantly, how you're operationalizing it. And before I forget, I, I want to ask you one thing in particular. Um, I want you to do some research for me and find out about citizenship in the Netherlands because if Donald Trump becomes president. I'm actually going to move to the Netherlands. I just want to lay that right. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see you with that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, well, ex we are very great people, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. There's no doubt in my mind. I'll tell you what I what I think is interesting. And I'm sure Susan, Tiff, and and Leah would agree with this is it would be interesting for the work that you're doing to get connected with Susan and her team and you can talk to them like what's going on hands on. I know we talked about potentially in July when I'm over there to meet with you and your team with some of the schools in England, um, but it might be, and if not better, I know it's further away, um, but it might even be more enriching to at least make a trip out here and we can hook you up with some schools there, but you and I can talk about that. I just. I just think it's important for the people that we're working with in our demonstration sites and in Corwin and, and Mitch, obviously, who, who sponsors all this, is just to get a sense of what's going on throughout the world from the Netherlands that we don't hear about all the time, but really digging in deep with that. So I, I appreciate I appreciate that and what you're doing. I'm going to ask you to stay right there as well. Oh, let me ask you one, one question first, because I think this is, and then I'll, I'll flip it over and we'll get Lisa Landy in. When you're thinking around the student voice piece, Ingrid, what, from the student perspective, what's been their biggest challenge uh, in the sense of, is there a piece of that that they're not sure of or are they frightened about voice? Do you think the students are ready to have a voice yet? Or are you doing a lot of work kind of getting them prepared that they can have a voice? You're asking me that question, right? Because I love yes. connection. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um... What um what we see at the moment, I, we also work with special ed, and uh, uh, just because of the differences, what we see is that the hardest challenge is to really trust children to have a voice, but also to uh, trust them that they can follow up after their voice. You do you understand what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Um, and that is, yeah, that is one of the biggest. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges. One of a great example we have now also is that we started this this past year. We started in our initial teacher trainer program, a special program. It's called Teachers College, and that's also where we use the framework of student voice to uh, support students to design as a teacher artist their own education. So we we have purposes, of course. You become a teacher, but what sort of teacher do you want to be? And so we use their the, yeah, all the aspects of self-worth and belonging yeah. and engagement, but also the leadership responsibility part. And um, we, well, what we are up against is struggling against uh, our even even my colleagues, some of my colleagues that say uh, it's impossible that they can design their own goals. So I try to explain to them about the aspiration model and say, well, when well, you have purpose and you have that very clear, and your aim is very is connected. To, to the presence, you, then you know you must trust that it will work. Um, mm -hmm. That's one of the biggest challenges we have. So so I trust students to be able to do the work because we see in so many schools, but yeah, also within our high schools. Let's say high schools they call differently here, but um, the teachers say, well, they're not motivated, and that's not something new. You hear that too. I think I think you hear that around the globe, unfortunately. Um, 
but uh, how do we uh, support teachers but also support each other as colleagues to really uh, uh, trust each other and also in the collaboration with our students and with our children that we want to teach. And uh, I think at the moment that is our biggest challenge. We design for them but not with them. And, mm -hmm. um, and especially of course when you work at a university it's easy to design and come up with a module and to come up with oh this should be good and that should be nice. Um, but basically, we formed a design team with our students, and I'm one of the the I'm one I'm part of the design team. But I'm you know they see of course I'm the uh, I'm responsible for the whole program. But uh, I I we come up with uh, a design where students have the right and also that they can trust this if what they say is valuable within the program, and so they they see and they connect with their own program and. Uh, um, uh, of course, we, we ask them questions like, so if we do this, so what would the government say about this? And what would happen if we would go that direction? And it's, it's actually, it's kind of funny because we hit the newspaper today <laughs> with a big article on, you know, um, how challenging it was that we gave students control of their own learning, which of course is kind of funny that we need to say that. But if, um, so basically, I think if, if you would sum it up, it would be um, trust. And real leadership for students, that would be, uh, and, and teachers just being able to let go and trust. But of course, not to let go and just let it slip away, because that's not, you can really have a partnership with students. But it's Beautiful. hard work. It is hard work, and it, it's people like you and Susan and Lee and Tip that are making it all real for us. So thank you. Stay right on there, too, because it's a perfect segue around the teacher piece um, with, with Lisa Landy. Lisa Landy. Actually, you're going to have to turn that off and come over here. So, Lisa just came in this morning. Uh, um, Lisa Landy, as many of you know, is the, the director of the Teacher Voice and Aspirations International Center. Lisa came in today and is at Quiza because tomorrow is a big event. Um, unfortunately, not like Ingrid or Susan Tiffolia, she is no longer starstruck, uh, <laughs> which is a bit disappointing. Um, but before we flip this over, Lisa, I did get one interesting um, Twitter thing that, that came in. They asked me, this is incredibly important, they asked if I got my hair cut, and the answer is no. I just pulled it back because sometimes my mother watches this and I'm so sick and tired of hearing from her to get a haircut. So, uh, so no, the hair is still in place. Um, but um, you know, share with them what's going on, and I think after hearing from Ingrid and Susan, yeah. this does nothing but make you even more excited. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, now that we've got the important news about your hair not being cut. I'm just out saying of the that's way, three tweets. Yeah, <laughs> really important. Um, no, I, truthfully, my heart is full, and I, sitting here listening, I wish I could give kind of a virtual hug to both Susan and her team and to Ingrid, um, because you're you're saying things that are just so, I think, incredibly important and exactly at the heart of what the Teacher Voice and Aspirations International Center is about and the ideals that we're, we're trying to work hard to bring to more schools and more people to, to be like-minded thinkers with what you guys are talking about. So tomorrow we are holding a Teacher Voice Symposium at Southern New Hampshire University, one of our partners, and so we're grateful for their support and the opportunity to bring this event to their campus tomorrow. And there'll be a group of educators coming from all over the place to come together and talk about this issue of teacher voice and what, what, is it, what does it even mean? What are examples from practice? What are goals and, and things that we want to work towards? I wish that those that have just spoken today could all be there tomorrow because then we wouldn't have to do anything. We could just turn it over um, to exactly them to share their best practices. But it, it's really kind of about creating the same type of environment that we have these webinars within a symposium environment for people to come together and, and talk about things that are happening. We have some great thinkers that have committed to come, a number of people who are on the board for the organization, Ray McNulty, the dean at um, the College of Ed at SNHU, um, Peter DeWitt, Lisa Shaw is coming from, from Corwin, um, some of my very favorite people in the world, Mickey, Brian, and Russ will all be there from the Quiza team. Um, and we're really looking forward to the conversation that's going to occur tomorrow. Interestingly enough, at another event we were just recently at in Canada, we had a group who had heard about the event and they said, can, can
can we come? And I'm like, yeah, Canada is a long ways away, but sure, you can come. And they said, well, we want to come through Blab. And um, I had no idea what they were talking about. But apparently, Blab is some new app that I've now downloaded on my phone uh, and will be learning how to use tomorrow. But there's a group of, um, a significant sized group of teachers across Canada that are coming together as a learning community and having conversations through this um, piece of social media called, called Blab. So we will be tweeting out instructions. If anybody else is interested in joining the conversation, we'll be using Twitter. But um, if you're interested in this thing called Blab, B L A B, um, we'll be using the hashtag school voice tomorrow, and our Twitter handle is um, T Voice Matters. So if you want to join us in either of those ways, uh, you can. But we're really excited for the event and the opportunity to continue the conversation. I think there's real growing interest in this topic. I love what both of you have said that in order, both of the speakers today, that in order for us to really be able to do this work with students, we need to also be considering the exact same guiding principles and conditions for teachers and for the adults in the building. And so we're really passionate about taking that conversation to Southern New Hampshire University tomorrow. Great. Well, thank you. You bet. Uh, you can I now scooch away? You can if you want to. But and you I don't... still think you're really amazing. Yeah, thank you. Okay, okay yeah. then you can stay. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> now, we're, we're all looking forward to what's happening tomorrow. It'll, it'll be fun. I mean, it'll be fun, but also really engaging. And, um, we will re release those proceedings, what we're learning to everybody else out there. Summits or conferences or what's it called, institutes or mm -hmm. anything else out there to, to have that in isolation, but to kind of listen and, and learn from those and, and then share out that information. One of the things I was asking, so we can make connections with the people that are on specifically, Susan, if it's okay with you and Ingrid, get the two of you connected, see what's going on. Um, at your school, um, Susan Lee and Tiff, and, and share with, with Ingrid because I'll make those connections. I think that'll be really powerful. Um, let's do this. We're unbelievable, shockingly right on time, which I'm so happy about. Um, let's give Mitch, if we can, three minutes. Um, three minutes for people to kind of regroup themselves, talk to each other, and then I'm going to hand it over to Mick the last 15 minutes. But before I do, um, oh, so when you get in these groups, Come up with some questions for either Ingrid or Susan. Um, yeah, there actually, so there was a question uh, from Simon, and it was really for Ingrid. Is there any sign of universities in the UK taking note of your work and learning from that? And then he said, ITT over here needs it. So, um, so I could bring Ingrid back up again if I can find you. If Ingrid, if you can click the raise hand button, I'll bring myself down. And bring you back up, or ah, maybe no, not don't raise your hand. You may be raising. There should be a raise hand button, but I'm going to bring myself down. I'm going to try to find. Ah, there you are. Okay. <laughs> this is our Simon, right? Thank you. So. Ingrid, Anyone oh, she's coming. We're trying. <laughs> Ingrid, you. Hmm. Um, oh, I can, can hear you. Hear me again? Oh, perfect. So, do you know universities uh, that are doing it in the? My back. Do, yes, we can hear you okay now. Can you hear us? You can hear me. Can never. Yes. Hey, Mitch, could you bring Ingrid down for a minute? I want to flip this over to Mick for it. Can we just reverse what we're doing here for a second? Uh, is it the question that is written? <laughs> um, all right, so this is what we're going to do. We're back in control here. Um, so, oh, there's Mickey. So, perfect. So, hi, Mick. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I appreciate all of the the accolades that I've been getting, but the truth of the matter is, and the absolute belief in our work is that we are a team, and with Mickey, Brian, Lisa, Susan, Chris, and others, um, Sue Hopper, who's right to my left, really is my right-hand person, but interestingly, she's at my left right now, um, but her and Deb, we just have such an amazing, amazing team, and I feel like Susan, when Susan was talking about the work, how we're all in this together and that we learn from each other, so um, I'm going to pass this off to Mick, and Mick, if you could facilitate 
um, some of the Q&A things going, uh, going on. I'm going to take off. This is being totally transparent. I'm going to try to do this without you missing me, except I've got to go to Logan Airport right now, which is a little tight right at the moment. So I'm going to scoot out of here. A heartfelt thank you to Mitch again um, and to everybody on, on my team that, that's making this work. And Ingrid, thank you for staying up a little extra later tonight and for doing our book. There is the other half of the book right there. I know Susan, Tiff, and Leah know Mick, um, but my brother, my colleague, um, and most importantly, the person that always keeps me in line, uh, Mickey, they're all yours. So thank you, guys. See yes. ya. See you tomorrow. Yep, see you tomorrow. Yeah. Um, well, hi, everybody. Um, I can actually pick up that question that was asked for, for Ingrid um, because I'm aware that Teach First in the uh, UK, which is the UK's version of Teach for America. Um, nope. Yeah, it is. Let me just shout the question there. Uh, Teach First uses some of our work to um, help train their teachers, the new teachers, and to also uh, give them formative feedback from the student's point of view. They use one of our surveys called I Know My Class, uh, which is a classroom level survey as part of their teacher training and teacher formation. So they're trying to get these baby teachers right from the outset to, um, to, to seriously consider student voice. Uh, I can actually piggyback on that because yesterday, a little uh, update from um, my work, um, Yesterday, I was in New Orleans at the NAAC conference, the National Association for Alternative Certification. So outside of uh, traditional schools of education uh, as a pathway, you know, master's degrees in, um, in education for becoming a teacher, these are alternative certification programs. And they had asked uh, through Corwin for a, um, you know, workshop on student voice. And I was, I was there doing that yesterday. Um, and, you know, we talked a lot about, I don't know if this is a, hopefully addressing Simon's question, we talked a lot about not only uh, student voice in teacher training and are we adequately, adequately preparing the next generation of teachers, um, not just to be cogs in the inherited model of school, if I can say it that way, um, the inherited industrial model of school. So not just to fit in, but to be a transformative presence, which from our bias, it means they have to be ready to take seriously student voice. Um, but also our work calls for an invitation uh, for teachers to pay attention to the implicit curriculum, not just the explicit curriculum. So all of that, that Susan Koyanis and that Ingram were both sharing about the role that um, self-worth and engagement and purpose and the conditions play in the life of the school as a, as a means of raising academic achievement, as Susan was sharing, and as a, uh, a means of to say it this way, managing student behavior, or really, uh, be better to say, to have them manage their own behavior uh, so that we're not, you know, in these command and control cycles with them. Um, that's, that was a part of the conversation yesterday as well, and uh, we believe, you know, has to be part of teacher training moving forward, whether that's through outfits like Teach First in the UK or uh, NAAC here and and through Ray McNulty really uh, hoping to influence more traditional uh, schools of education where he's the Dean of Ed there up in Southern New Hampshire University. So um, so anyway, I, that's kind of a long winded answer to that question. Um, I want to I want to pick up though Russ's um, sort of final thing there before we tried to get Ingrid back, which was to get you guys pleading groups um, and either asking each other questions or sharing something you heard that really intrigued you or something you wondered or want to critique. Um, so why don't we take just, um, I, my uh, device says 349. So if we can take Mitch uh, about maybe just two sure. or three minutes, people in groups. So, so this would be the time that uh, what you should do is you should click on the icon of another person here, uh, if you have sound and video. And probably a good time to just to recap with the other person. What did you take out of today is, pro is probably yeah, a good thing. Out. If you if you don't have um, video or if you don't if if you don't have a microphone on your computer, uh, if um, if you could type into the I, that I am chat so you could share with others, it's, um, that might be another way to to type in some of the things you, that you took away. I have um, Eastern time about three fifty. Why don't we give people two minutes? Two okay, minutes. okay, and then you and I will both come down, and then I'll bring you back up in two minutes and. Um, We'll go on. 
Okay, let me bring Mickey back up. And uh, so, so I'm going to, you know, turn the question on to you. Is uh, what did you get out of today's session? Me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, uh, one of the things I was thinking about, in, in sort of as a way of wrapping up today, is um, you know I'm incredibly proud of the work Susan's doing there in Harding too, and and my colleague there, Susan Inman, has done a great job in guiding the whole Youngstown district uh, in their efforts there to turn around that district. Um, and I was thinking, you know, back to two or three years ago uh, with the teams there, and what a grind it is. You know, it really is in the beginning when you open up this. I'll say it, a can of worms that is student voice, you know, and invite the kids um, to have a seat at the table where meaningful decisions are made and, and prepare the adults really to be um, partners in that environment. It can be a grind, you know, there, you can hit a lot of obstacles and a lot of, um, a lot of challenges to the traditional norms and customs of the school, which is for the adults to basically, you know, run the place. Um, and one of the things I've been finding gratifying recently, and this webinar was fitting in that pattern, was that the movement is really here. Um, you know, when you hear about all the countries that Russ mentions in these talks, but then you see someone like Ingrid up here, um, you know, when you're invited to speak in front of the NAAC, and when you know that Teach First is using the work, um, I also spoke at uh, in Montana at the state conference for the uh, exceptional, the, the adults who work with exceptional kids, so special ed. So when you start to see the work operating at that level, you realize that that grind that you go through in the schools is worth it. Um, and I think that was my takeaway today too, that there's there's no, you know, we, we see the pendulum swing around a lot in education. I've been in, in it for 30 years, you know, and movements come and they go and the pendulum swings back and forth. But this is one, and I, I appreciate the fact that I'm very biased, um, this is one I don't think is we're going to back up from this. I don't think we're going to swing back to adult only command and control. Um, I think all of us in this webinar and anyone who's going to listen to this webinar afterwards, uh, all the people doing this good work in schools, recognize the efficacy of students as partners and um, using something like a framework. It could be ours. You know, it could be another framework. But whatever the framework is, making sure students have a voice um, in their learning environment. And okay, so so um, actually, so there's a couple questions, and I have to. I am somebody also with who had a longer question, but so I, you know, I, I want to make sure there's time. Um, there's uh, Jerry Briscoe asked. Uh, he's from Alaska, um, and he's looking for ways to incorporate student voice with culturally culturally responsive teaching strategies and brain research. Um, can you, in, in three words or less, can you answer that? No, <laughs> but now can you, can you answer his question? My, everyone who knows me right now is laughing hysterically. He's never done anything in three words or less. Um, well, let's start with brain research because I think that's fairly easy. Um, and, and I'll just say that there's a lot in brain research that talks about right now how um, they, they don't use the word voice, but in brain research would use terms like efficacy and ownership um, and how we're kind of hardwired to, uh, to sort of want to be responsible for our own goals and our own behaviors. There's a lot of that in brain research. Um, I, I just wrote a chapter in the new book, actually a section in the new book, which is all about how adolescence especially is a ripe time for, you know, that challenging we get for autonomy, you know, in, in adolescence. Uh, that's that's uh, the brain saying, hey, it's time to just have a voice. Like, don't just tell them, don't just do what they tell you. Um, and there's something very important there from an evolutionary point of view that's happening in brain research. So it lines up really well. Um, but, you know, I, I remember my two-year-old saying to me, daddy, let me do it, let me do it. So, um, you know, I think I think the human person is hardwired for, for responsibility and voice. We school it out of people. Right. We teach people to stop being responsible and to stop making decisions for themselves. Let me control your behavior. Um, and so that's where brain research fits in. Uh, we get the, the constant um, invitation to crosswalk with uh, cultural competency. One of the real yeah. problems, I think, um, with a mostly white, sorry, mostly female teaching population is, um, uh, you know, when we hear the voice of the other, whether the other is um, a different race than us, a different uh, set of capacities than we have, you know, just I'll use that catch-all of the other. Um, 
what we're looking at there is their voice. They're, you know, that's just another sort of um, analog for their point of view, their culture, the, everything that they bring to the table that comes through their voice to us that we sometimes go, well, what is that? What is that other thing? So I think mm -hmm. there's an important need for voice in um, the effort to do more cultural to teaching. Until I'm ready to listen to you, to accept your voice for what it is, I'm never going to get the cultural competency. Um, well, and, 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 cultural proficiency. and as you're talking, I was thinking back to something that Susan said, at, or one of her team said on the, in the very beginning, is that student voice is not another thing that gets put on schools. Voice is what gets embedded in everything that you do. So, um, so, and you know, allowing people to express their culture is part of what voice is is, is about. Yeah. Um, so it's not it's not a matter of oh we're we're now going to give time for student voice. It's like we're we're allowing people to express themselves as part of our strategy of doing everything. Exactly. When Susan said that, and she's probably heard me say this a billion times, it's not a new way of thinking. It's not a, it's not something new to do. It's a new way of thinking about everything you already do. Oh, that's uh, great. That's exactly it, yeah. And then Simon asked, asked another question. Um, and so, you know, I don't know. He already asked the question, so we have to bill him double for this. Um, yeah. But he asked... Um, this is uh, we we would call call this a um, a hanging curve because you should be able to hit this one out of the park, okay? So the question is, do you think that you could plan an event for the UK because it probably would be very well received? Yeah, the event in the UK is the Aspirations Academy Trust. It's already there. I mean, there's 12 schools. There's two more coming online under Ian Livingston, who's the father of modern gaming. Um, he invented the modern gaming movement. He wanted to open two schools and he, he found us to be partners with. So uh, two new schools in the Aspirations Academy Trust based on gaming principles, cross tab with student voice and, and the Aspirations framework. So the event is in place. You just need to go find Aspirations Academy Trust, Simon. Um, Steve Kenning and, and Paula there, uh, you know, run the joint under Russ's chairmanship uh, as president and founder. We were over there doing teacher training. They've been five years now, um, you know, in place. And, uh, and, and I think five, Ingrid five wants. To, yeah. And I think Ingrid wants to sponsor an event in the Netherlands. That would be great. So. Yeah. Hey, just get in touch with us uh, through our website or through Corwin, and we're happy to uh, we're happy to go anywhere. Um, you know, because we want to keep pushing on the movement. Um, so I paraphrase. She just she actually said, "I think a European event would be great." But You're but I just she, I, to me that's volunteering to host the event, right? It sounds to me like it is, Ingrid. We're there. Okay. Plus, I hear you're translating the book, so we have to uh, you know make sure it's. I know nothing about other languages, but uh, but I'll have to look and make sure the words look like they're in the right place. So, so did you? So basically, we're th we're at the hour now, and and you know I don't want to keep people extra. Is there anything that you want to use as a you know to summarize? I know you guys are going to be here in about a month as well. Um, looking for the date, I, April fourth. Yeah, April fourth, we'll be back. Um, no, you know I made a couple notes to myself. One of the uh, one of the things I'm very excited about myself is this. What you heard Russ allude to, Project Aspire. Uh, one of the things I was doing when I was in the UK uh, with him was I did two live launches of Project Aspire. It's probably the most scalable thing we've invented um, to get involved with our work. It's kind of an off-the-shelf platform that walks people through the, uh, the framework and student voice and how to do it. A lot of the questions I saw beforehand were, how, well, what is engagement? What do you mean by it? And how do you concretely do belonging in your school? You know, So Project Aspire is a way of, of getting people through the framework in a very user-friendly, asynchronous um, you know, safe way. So people are interested, again, they can go to QISA.org and check that. I'm, I'm excited about that. And the more people we put in Project Aspire, the better it gets because it's like also like Yelp for um, for PD. You can constantly keep feeding back to us what you think of the platform and we can keep improving it. Mm -hmm. And Sue Harper, who was there with us, she, she's a big part of the, um, the backstage of that. So um, yeah, that's all. People could, we, there's lots of free stuff on our website and uh, people who have questions, they can probably find an answer there. And if not, our email addresses are there, so feel free to get in touch with us. Okay. Well, um, Mickey, thank you. Um, it's it's always great listening to and, and talking with, with, with all of you. And yeah. um, you're doing great stuff. So thank you. Uh, thank you for hosting us and, and for supporting this work through, through the hosting. We, really, we do really appreciate it.
Okay, well, um, see you next month. Uh, maybe email with you uh, uh, before then. And uh, this is Mitch Weisberg. I'm signing off for EdChat Interactive. Please uh, consider joining us this evening. We're talking about writing. Uh, and uh, next week where we have two sessions coming up as well. Uh, talk to you soon. And uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are.